Welcome, gentle listener. I will apologize immediately to you, for I have been a liar. A liar of omission. You may have seen me extol the joys of the game in my bat reps and product reviews. You may have heard my passion when narrating the beginnings of the law. But I have kept you in the dark for your own protection. I have been keeping something from you. And I feel it is now time. For there is a reason that Warhammer 40k is not just liked or even obsessed over, but loved. Warhammer 40k is truly loved by its fans for very good reason. A reason I am about to reveal to you in all its bittersweet glory. It is not that toys, as splendid as they are, it is not the painting, as therapeutic as it is. It is not even the socialization and relaxation which I laud so very much. It is the escapism. It is in its depth. No other fictional universe I know of, not even that of the Star Wars saga, has such depth. It is encapsulated in one terrible moment and one single image. But you must understand it to understand why it is so potent. What I call the longest second. It is contained within the story that I am about to tell you. But the moment I speak of is the defining instant that evokes such passion and loyalty in this world's adherence. It is why I consider the tale among the best and most heart-rending fiction in modern Western literature. It may never gain the acclaim it deserves, and I certainly will not be able to do it justice. But I will try. So, gentle listener, put your hand in mine, metaphorically, and let us go to the darkest point in the universe that which I call the longest second. Let us see why the Warhammer universe is so important to so many, why it stands the test of time. So, let us explore the existing lore of one of the greatest heroes, possibly the most tragic hero of the Warhammer universe, where this moment is contained. I introduce to you, gentle listener, the tale of the Primarch of the Seventh Legion of the Legionis Astartes. To the Praetorian of Terra, welcome to the tale of Rogal Dawn. Now, let us begin our journey. I must give you the briefest of snapshots of history, which I will cover in further detail later, because it has such a colossal, overbearing import to the story I must relate today. Also do bear in mind that this is merely an introduction to Rogal Dawn. To cover his history would simply not be consumable via this medium without a plethora of sittings. So be aware that I will revisit segments of this history in greater detail in the future, if it is requested. In a time of abject horror, a time when humanity was almost extinguished, a man arose to save us all. This individual was a man later known only as the Emperor of Mankind. For in the future, humanity had developed and bestrode the stars, forming a mighty confederation of planets far and wide. But as with all things, it was not to last. The means by which ships traversed the galaxy was called a warp drive, transporting into another adjacent universe known as the Immaterium or Warp. Ships could travel to far distant stars in fractions of the time it would take them in the real world, the Materium. So the Human Federation colonized the stars when they developed these technologies. Technologies that would awe the people of today 
Well, for that matter, those of the later period of the 41st millennium. Humanity believed itself untouchable. Its robotic armies, the men of iron, were without number. Its fleet so advanced none, not even the ancient race called the Elderai, could match them without huge cost. Humanity was ascendant and felt its time had come. It felt invulnerable. But thus do all fools begin, with hubris, with arrogance. A string of things happened over a very short period of time in the grand scheme of things. But do not worry, as I shall cover them all in more detail in my own inimitable style at another juncture. But let us list them now, so we have context. The men of iron, the very armies of humanity turned on their masters. Hardly novel, but the way in which this impacts is in phenomenal and very distinct. But we shall get into the nuances another time. Just know that much of humanity died in that ages-long struggle, which they barely won, with the assistance of others against their own automated army. When humanity was on its knees, still recovering from the holocaust that was a cybernetic revolt, further disasters then struck. The warp, which facilitated fast and light travel, became almost impossible. Huge warp storms closed off much of the galaxy and made travel effectively impossible. As the confederation of planets of the humans had always relied so heavily on trade and cooperation, the effects were immediate and catastrophic. Entire worlds would previously be cities or industrialized and relied entirely on the produce of their neighbors. These planets' populations swiftly went into famine and then into starvation. Rioting occurred across the galaxy and the human civilization was swept away. Planets that relied on the goods and equipment produced by their neighbors were similarly unable to survive or regressed into feudal worlds where the rule of the sword and might alone or that one could hope for justice and peace. It was a time of strong men. On top of this, humanity started to realize its potentials again, and psychers, those able to tap into the energies of the warp to create wonders or defy the rules of the galaxy, started emerging with increased regularity and with increased ability to harness the warp. The sad truth is that planets and societies that embraced this Nova Homus, the new man, the Psyche, were eventually to regret their openness. For as the Psychers emerged, their powers to tap into the warp started to attract evils that had never yet been encountered by humanity in the real world, the Materium. Psychers would succumb to the dark whispers of the denizens of the warp and be possessed denizens that the Imperium now call demons, and entire sectors would fall to their predictions. A demon is almost impossible to defeat without a fully trained and astonishingly experienced and powerful psyche on one side, or the kind of technology and weaponry that was fast disappearing due to the regression of huge swathes of human civilization. It was not to be as there were none to train these nascent psychers, none to protect them. The carnage and enslavement of these beings went unchecked for the most part, and again, the population of humanity shrunk even more. Their freedom torn from them, and their lives reduced to that of cattle, chattel, or fodder, for the whims of their immortal and godlike masters, and Xenos alike. As humanity weakened, those races with which they had allied with to match the threat of the men of iron, their allies, all turned on them. Perhaps this is the propaganda of the Emperor, but none live who can gainsay or refute his reading of a past that he alone survived. For the Emperor is immortal and has lived for a very long time. Thus did humanity get assailed and enslaved or destroyed also by their erstwhile allies. A crime, a pain, that the Emperor has never forgotten, 
and his sons have been reminded of ere ever they embarked on the campaigns of the Great Crusade. This period is named the Age of Strife. By others, Old Knight, and it deeply affected the entire subconscious of the human race, scarred it beyond recognition. For thousands of years, humanity was beaten, killed, enslaved, and corralled. We were almost stricken from history, and would have eventually been so, if it were not for the coming of the Emperor of Mankind. On the birth planet of humanity, once called Earth, now called Terra, T-E-R-R-A, the Emperor, who had watched all the ages of mankind, arose. He threw off his lifelong rules and fetters that prevented him from ever revealing himself. Before, he had no need, but now, this eternal human, the most powerful of all our kind, reckoned that there was simply no alternative. Terra itself had become a wasteland of feuding techno-barbarian states with the technology to create biological and mechanical terrors. It was infested with evil psychos and immoral wizards, entire states that had fallen to control by Xenos, the Imperium's term for aliens. All the populace of Terra could do was look on in horror as their lives were effectively hell. There was nothing but darkness and evil, pain and tyranny, until the coming of the Emperor. Within a scant few hundred years, he had created his custodian guard and his thunder warriors, the precursors to his space marines, and took the fight out to the lands around him. He began the wars of unification. We will skip to the end of this period, as I will update you as time goes on, with the lore of that period as I can. But needless to say, the Emperor crushed all before him, and unified the humans of Earth, of Terra, and destroyed any and all outside influences that had helped to bring humanity low. But this was just the beginning. The Emperor prepared a great crusade, a great army to go forth from Terra, and with but one goal alone, the saving of humanity. With his genetically engineered warriors, the Adeptus Astartes, his space marines, he prepared to take back the galaxy in the name of peace and justice. As the solar system fell to his designs, the technological armies of Mars were added to his forces, for Mars had survived semi-intact the Age of Strife. Although a shadow of the power of the Human Confederation, the tech priests of Mars still commanded great power and had fleets of warships and terrifying forces of titans, colossal vehicles of war. With Mars on his side and his genetically engineered armies growing apace, the Emperor took off into the galaxy on a twofold mission. The first, as stated, to bring freedom, wisdom and safety to the beleaguered humans spread across the stars. The second mission was, while moving ever onwards and outwards, to find the suns he had built. For there were twenty legions of superhuman warriors, the Astartes, that had been crafted and grown, but each was different due to their template being a different Primarch. The Primarchs, which I will cover in more detail soon, were twenty demigods, the twenty sons of the Emperor that he genetically designed, forged and prepared to lead his armies in his great crusade. They were made from his very own genetic stock and in his image. But in a terrible moment before their birth, each was taken in their capsules and spread amongst the stars by the powers of chaos. The gods of chaos who hate the Emperor of Mankind naming him the Anathema, seemed terrified of the power the Emperor would have if he had his sons with him. But they were not able to destroy the Primarchs for some reason. So they found a chink in his armors, a hole in his wards, in the Emperor's palace under the Himalaya mountains, and whisked away his sons and deposited them on worlds across the galaxy. 
Thus, as the crusade moved outward, it would, one by one, find the Parnarchs, the very sons of the Emperor. And mighty sons they were. Each dwarfed a space marine as much as a space marine would a normal human. But not just in size, but also in intellect, subtlety, skill, reflexes, wisdom, and power. Truly the Primarchs were titans of old, and heroes the like that would put Perseus, Achilles, or even mighty Heracles to shame. And so it was that the capsule that contained the infant Rogal Dawn landed on a planet called Inwit, an ice world and a hard place for humanity to even survive on. Locked in its orbit around the sun, one side of the world was ever shrouded in darkness, the other in light but neither prosperous or easy. In which sun was old and gave off little heat or light, so the planet was more akin to a ball of ice than what we would consider a planet for human habitation. The populace of Inwit were hardy and stern, as they had no choice, as weakness was death. A harsh civilization that bred stoic and rugged determination as a matter of course. To quote, Conflict against the Roman clans was common, and young warriors learned how to defend against their clan's enemies as early as they learned how to endure the death touch of Inwit's merciless chill. They were incredibly quick learners, and had an innate sense of an object's functional value, and most importantly, they have the strength and intelligence to conquer those who possess knowledge they do not. Long ago, before the coming of the Emperor, was even a dream or night-shrouded terror. The people of Inwit began to create their own realm in the stars. On every world they took, they assimilated, realigned, and reinforced. With each conquest, their culture and learning grew. But Inuit itself remained unchanged, even as it became the center of a stellar empire. The ice hives and clan disputes remained and while their world birthed starships and ringed its orbits with weapon stations, its rulers kept to the old ways, the ways that had created their strength. The warlords and matriarchs who commanded armies amongst the stars, still living lives little easier than their vassals. It was as part of this burgeoning empire that Rogal Dawn grew to manhood, and then to rule its domains as emperor. Much of his early years remain unknown, or at least little talked about. It is, however, certain that in the cold and darkness of Inwit, a boy named Rogel by his adoptive kin rose to lead the House of Dawn, also known as the Ice Cast, and then to the rule of the Inwit Cluster. The patriarch of the clan that raised Dawn became an adoptive grandfather to him and taught him much of tactics, strategy, and diplomacy. Even after he discovered he was not blood-related to his grandfather, Dawn held his memory in high value. He kept a fur-edged robe that had belonged to the man, and slept with it on his bed every night. His qualities married perfectly with those of Inward, and he pushed their empire further than any other. Rogel led and trained his armies and fashioned spacecraft the like of which had not been seen before. Rogel then discovered a piece of luck. On his voyages of discovery, his ships came across a relic of the past, a great and powerful weapon. For in the Inwit system there was a vessel from the Dark Age of Technology, a battleship of vast size which Dawn named the Phalanx. With this as his new capital ship and flag, he moved out and continued the work of his forebears of Inuit. He expanded the empire across the neighboring systems at a frightening pace, the hardy people of Inuit following wherever he led. Rogel's fleets then made contact with the outmost pathfinders and rogue traders at the vanguard of the Great Crusade. He was the seventh of the twenty Primarchs to be discovered by his father, the Emperor of Mankind. The meeting was a joyous one, for Rogel recognized the greatness in the Emperor and his connection with him the moment they met. For the Emperor, the blessing and joy was magnified by the discoverer of not only a son, but a thriving and powerful military culture as well. 
Rogal Dawn offered the mighty ship, the Phalanx, to his father, the Emperor. So loyal was he, so swiftly. But the Emperor gave it back to him to command and bade him to take command of the Astartes, the Space Marines, that had been made out of Rogal's own genetic stock. Effectively, Rogal's long-lost sons. Dawn accepted, but he had conditions. Dawn did not speak a single word to his legion when he first met them. He is quiet and brooding, a demigod watching them while they tried to please him. He insisted he watched them in combat, and watched them he did. When the battle was over, he finally broke his silence. Rogel Dawn informed them that they were warriors, but they had much to learn. So, in his inimitable way, Rogel forged his connection with his legion, the only way that could ever have happened by example. Dawn trained his men, and his leadership and guidance complemented their existing skills and honed them to a razor's edge. The Seventh Legion had merged with their Primarch more seamlessly than ever before, and became a thing of dread and wonder. For the reason why the Sons were so like their father, the Imperial Fists of the Seventh Legion, I will leave to their own video, but it was a match made in heaven. It was perfection. From there, the days of the Crusade began for Rogal Dawn and his newly forged legion, the Seventh, the Imperial Fists. The Crusade was a constant struggle, a constant war, but one Rogal was more than equipped for in every way. He started fighting alongside the Emperor, as all of the Primarchs did, bar only one. When he had been moulded and the Emperor had decided it was time, Rogal was seconded to the forces of his oldest brother. I say oldest, as in he was the first found by the Emperor, the longest serving at his side, the most trusted and trained by the Emperor. He was Horus Lupercal, the hammer of the Emperor, and later, his war master. Rogal finally serving alongside not only an equal for the first time in his life, but one he considered worthy of his respect, and perhaps a little of adoration. For to Rogel, Horus Lupercal was everything a Primarch and statesman, warrior and leader should be. Rogel and Horus were fast friends, and firm ones. Once Horus himself stated that his legion, the Lunar Wolves, let it be called, the sons of Horus after Ulanor, were the finest in assault, and that if he met the Imperial Fists in war, that it would be an unending stalemate. The irresistible force versus the immovable object. So high in Horus's opinion was his loyal and redoubtable brother Rogel. They fought side by side as brothers on many campaigns. They thought they would never be anything but the closest of friends. But Rogel was most often in the theatres of war led directly by the Emperor, and became known to be like a shadow to the master of mankind. Rogel also made bonds with other Primarchs over many campaigns thereafter, but he was not charismatic or outgoing, and could be known as blunt, so did not always fit in or act in a way to elicit true friendship. The other Primarch he shared a special bond with was, of course, the one Primarch that nearly all of the brothers not only respected but loved. It was Sanguinius, the Primarch of the Blood Angels. In Sanguinius he found the traits that most exemplified the goal of the Crusade and the best in humanity, despite Sanguinius's obvious mutation, the wings that grew out of his back. Rogel and Sanguinius's relation was only to grow into one of true camaraderie and respect. In the dark times that followed, it was always his brother Sanguinius in which he trusted, in the war to end all wars. It was his brother the angel that strode forth when he could not, despite Rogel wishing with all his heart that he could go instead and save the angel, just in case. It was also his brother Sanguinius alone who shared in the burden of the defense of the palace. But we get ahead of ourselves. Sanguinius, Rogel and Horus formed a special friendship that few understood. They had something in common that only one other shared. But for that, we must wait for the moment. 
In the Crusade, the forces of the Imperium pushed forever out and out, further and further. None could stop them. None could gainsay their power, their purpose, their path. And in the Crusade, all of the worst horrors of old night, the period of humanity's weakness and need, were highlighted in graphic display. The Xenos tyrants they fought, crushing humans under their feet. The mad sorcerers and psychers who dominated all life for systems around. The degradation of humanity was finally over whenever the Crusade arrived. The Crusade, as far as Rogel was concerned, brought emancipation, safety and hope to all of the lost tribes of humanity. And it punished their gaulers, their abusers and their foes. Where other legions moved forward in lightning swift raids and brought planets into imperial compliance fast, but moved on as quickly, it was not the way of the imperial fists. Where Horus might have won the Imperium, it is said that Rogel Dawn built it. Wherever a war had been fought, Rogel set up defences and hard points, castles and keeps, so that no insurrection would rise, but also so those worlds he conquered were defensible, and their peoples left with pride. He built each world up and did not move on until he had improved the conditions of all those who lived there, as his brother Horus had taught him, and his father, the Emperor, had instructed him. Rogel believed. Where others fought for the battle, or for glory, or for accolades and honours, Rogel fought because he believed. He believed in his brothers. He believed in his father. But most important of all, he believed in the dream. The bright and beaming dream of a humanity free, safe and happy, where they need not fear the skies or the dark or privation or ignorance. Rogel fought for a better tomorrow for his entire race. And he built that better tomorrow with every castle, keep and border he constructed. Rogel believed in the dream of the Imperium of Man. The Crusade came to a head finally with two great campaigns. One I cannot mention here, but the other was the campaign at Alanor. At Alanor the greatest collection of greenskins ever witnessed occurred, and the forces of the Imperium of Man rose to the occasion. It was the Emperor and Horus Lupercal who met this threat head on. Others were involved, but it was these two titans of war that met the leadership of the Alanor Orcs at the heaviest of the fighting. On the day the great Orc warboss finally was brought to Brook, the Emperor himself was saved by Horus, who beheaded the Greenskin Warlord, and the battle and the war was over. In recompense for this, and by the mountain of accolades and proofs of loyalty, fidelity and ability, did the Emperor elevate Horus Lupercal to the exalted state of Warmaster. The Emperor set him above his brothers to lead them as he had done beforehand. And with that the Emperor then left the crusade to return home to terror to deal with other issues. It was one of the greatest days in the life of Rogel for he genuinely admired his big brother and supported him, and, despite never showing it, as it was not his way, he was so happy for Horus. He thought no other would have made sense, and Horus repaid that trust and augmented it by secreting himself for a time and asking Rogel to help him reinvent himself, to define and agree the identity and duties of a war master and to set a bar that Horus must always hold himself to. Horus came to Rogel as one of his closest friends, but also as one of the most accomplished and powerful of all of the Primarchs in the arts of war. Also, to some extent, he came in statescraft, and how to manage his other brothers, for he had not forgotten that Rogel Dorn had once, before his finding by the Emperor, been monarch of an empire of warriors. The administrative approach of Gulliman would not have suited the situation, much as he is lauded for his ability, as it was a congregation of warriors of legend that Horus would have to ride, have to bend to his will, his direction. 
It could not be done by diktat. After a time, the emperor recalled Dawn to Terra to be his Praetorian. The emperor of mankind had his body and palace guards in the custodians, the Ten Thousand. But yet he called back Rogel to be with him, to protect Terra and the Sol system, and to improve the defenses of the imperial palace, much as they thought they would not be needed. Many were aggrieved at this singular honour. Perturabo of the, of the Iron Warriors in particular railed against this favouritism shown to Rogel, but Rogel did not care. Rogel Dawn knew that he was the best man to be at his father's side. I have a theory as to another reason that Rogel might have been at the Emperor's side. But again, we must wait for that dreaded moment. And it was at this point that the horror began in earnest, and nothing Rogel had seen before this prepared him for what was to come. Nothing could. Whilst he was leading a small contingent of his hand-picked guard on his way to Terra to take up his position as Praetorian, Rogel found a lost ship hailing for assistance. It was the Eisenstein. Aboard were Death Guard who demanded to speak with him immediately. In that fateful moment, that most charged of encounters, Rogel Dawn found out the terrible truth. The Death Guard warrior, Captain Nathaniel Garrow, was a harbinger of doom to Rogel, as he informed the Primarch that his brother, Horus Lupukal, had turned traitor and had recruited others and they were now in open rebellion against their father. For this, Garrow nearly lost his life, as Rogel was so staggered and raged by this infamy that he doubted Garrow so much he nearly killed him. Even though enough evidence came forward to prove the word of Garrow and confirm that the worst nightmare had started. The war master, Horus, had turned his back on the Imperium and the Emperor, and was preparing to make war on all those who remained loyal to the throne. Poor Rogel. One cannot imagine the crushing, heart-rending desolation he must have felt at this news. Why, he could not accept it Im immediately. For one of his brothers turning against the Emperor was one thing. Perhaps Angron, or humiliated Lorgar, or even the insane Conrad. But for his oldest brother, his big brother, the one he admired the most, the one he had vested the most hope in, to have fallen. In that moment it shook Rogel Dawn to the core. Out of nowhere, the hope, the dream of the Imperium was wounded as it had never been before for Rogel. For one of his brothers to turn would have elicited rage, not confusion. How Rogel must have hurt then, to have the greatest and closest Primarch to the Emperor, his war master, a most trusted son, to turn on him was beyond belief. For Horus Lupercal had turned his back not only on his sire, not only on his loyal brothers, but on the dream, on the dream of the Imperium. Also this would have thrown Rogel into such confusion, for if Horus, the brightest light, and the Primarch who seemed so ardently to believe in the hope of the Crusade, for Horus, to call it a lie was almost too much to bear. Rogel must have wanted to take flight to confront his brother immediately, not to fight him, but to implore him to return to the light. But no, Dawn, the warrior inside the soul of this Primarch, must have known. As soon as he heard that three of his brothers had fallen to the darkness surrounding Horus, he knew. He knew that Horus was not alone, and that the others would buoy him up and keep him on the course he was on. 
The likes of Angron or Mortarian were understandable. But Fulgrim? Shock upon shock. Horror upon nightmare. Grief piled on grief. With such surrounding him, Rogel knew that Horus would not be able to be taken from his path, would never be able to bend the knee and beg for clemency. He needed to be adored, so did Horus. So the die was cast, and Dawn knew it would not wash off. Dawn sent his fleet to the Istvan system where the treachery was occurring, and took himself and his elite to Terra to inform his father, the Emperor. Horus Lupercal had turned to evil. He had been seduced by the dark powers of corruption, the dark gods of chaos. More than this, he had turned other brothers with him. The visitors from the Einsenstein reported that Horus had turned Angron of the World Eaters, Fulgrim of the Emperor's Children, and Mortarion of the Death Guard. Four full legions were in revolt, led by the most able general of them all. Rogel returned to Terra and his father. The Emperor issued a full seven legions and their Primarchs to destroy the rebellion. As the Archtraitors mounted their defense and raised their banner on Istvan V, the retribution force of the Emperor prepared to land. Three legions were to make landfall first and assault the strong points of the traitors, to then be supported by the other four. The Salamanders, Iron Hands, and Raven Guard landed on Istvan and began their furious attack on the positions of Horus and his treacherous brothers. What happened next is too complex and too important to cover here, but in very brief, the three were tricked. They were betrayed. For the other four legions that landed behind them, the word bearers, Alpha Legion, Iron Warriors, and Night Lords had already gone over to the ruinous powers. They landed and set up fortifications, then joined with Horus's forces and simply blasted the three loyalist legions to smithereens. And when they were done with that, they drew out their chainswords and engaged in close combat. The butchery was great. The three loyalist legions, the Salamanders, Ravenguard and Iron Hands, were taken by surprise, betrayed and nearly exterminated that day. But worst of all, brother actually slew brother. Although Corvus Corax, Primarch of the Ravenguard, and Vulcan, Primarch of the Salamanders, managed to escape that terrible trap, Ferris Manus, the Primarch of the Iron Hands, was slain. His head cut off his shoulders by his erstwhile best friend and closest confidant in all of the Primarchs, no less than his brother, Fulgrim. What occurred to the Imperial Fist near Istvan will be covered in their own video, but after a short period, Rogel issued their recall to the Sol System to assist in its defense. His legion, despite having the upper hand against a more numerous opponent, and were winning did as instructed, and, taking casualties, they withdrew from combat and made their way to Terra as instructed, for the Imperial Fists were ever obedient to their lord, no matter the situation. The next few years were a living hell for Rogel Dawn. He was given command of the remainder of the Loyalist armies as the new War Master of the Emperor, outnumbered and constantly outmaneuvered by his brother, Horus Lupercal. The war always seemed to go against Rogel. He fought like a tiger, organized like a whirlwind, and was as tactically astute as any who could have filled his role. Better, perhaps, even than his opposite number, if their roles were reversed. But the inevitable occurred, and the Loyalists were pushed back again and again. Nor would all of his brothers obey his commands, nor follow his lead, despite the stakes involved. Lehman Russ, Primarch of the Space Wars, went off on his own rampage, nearly slaying the traitor Warmaster, but he did not finish the job when he had the chance. Then he and his legion and fleet 
were forced into consecutive battles all designed for one thing, the one thing Rogel feared most, the prevention of the Valka Fenrika, the Space Wolves, from being able to return to defend the Palace of Terror. Rogel was practically alone, his father fighting in the webway, his closest brothers defeated or in far-flung battle and unable to answer his klaxon call to the throne world. He only had Jagatai, a brother that few knew, few were still liked or trusted, despite him doing nothing to deserve the reaction. Rogel was, to all intents and purposes, so very, very alone. At this point I will apologize again to you, my gentle listeners, for I cannot bring myself to rush this subject, the very soul of Warhammer 40k. I had believed I would be able to condense this tale into but one video, but I find the subject matter, the work, is too great. I will not sacrifice the journey to the destination, for it would diminish the impact and import of the whole for this reason, I will ask your indulgence and beg for your forgiveness, for the content is too large. I must end this installment here. Also for the reason that the style and pace of the next segment will be so different that it makes logical sense. As the best storytellers all know, leave the best or the worst until last. I hope you will continue with me on this path to the darkest moment, the longest second, for it will be available soon.